Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, talk host by uh, DDMS. We are very happy to invite Sister Salve for this talk. Now, we shall do homage to the Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa We reverence for the Buddha words and attentiveness of mind. We strive to know the Dharma thoroughly with diligence and care so that we attain what the Buddha attained. We strive to practice the Dharma fully. We love in our hearts and because truth is the greatest gift, we will share the Dharma generously with others. Thank you. Uh, this is the introduction for Sita Salvia. Um, I think uh, she needs no further introduction. Uh, we shall proceed. Sita Salvia. Okay, bonds. Angut Tara Nikaya 4.10. Uh, tonight, I, I didn't go into my usual introduction into the topics and so on and so forth because it's a relatively short sutta. Uh, in fact, I think in terms of numbers of slides, it's maybe about 12 or so. And the, while the length of the sutta is short relative to several others that I've given recently, but in terms of meaning, in terms of how it can affect one's practice, this sutta has tremendous depth, profound depth. Not easy to understand because this is tackling practice right down to, I think, I would say this, this is the key of the practice. At a very high level of practice, when we are looking at mindful, when we are dealing with mindfulness and we're reflecting on the nature of the mind, how we are going to trim craving at that level, the practice is here. Okay. So we shall begin um, the very first opening para in this sutta, Anguttara Nikaya. Anguttara Nikaya means a numerical collection and this is from the book of four meaning there are four items and there are several types of four items that the Buddha cover this being one of them okay so the, the Buddha sat with his monks and he asked the monks what four there are these four bonds what four the bond of sensuality, Kama Yoga, the bond of existence, Bawa Yoga, the bonds of views, Diti Yoga, and the bond of ignorance, Avidya Yoga. I, I will be introducing the Pali word because the Pali words themselves have deep meanings. Okay? Yoga means connection tied together, tied together. And the very first one, born of sensuality. Karma means sense pleasure, senses. It is the pleasure associated with the sense organs connecting you, the inner you, to the outer world. So, your eyes with forms, the ear with sound, nose, odors, tongue, flavors, and bodily sensation, tangible. And the Buddha said, someone here, someone does not understand as they really are, the bond of sensuality, as the bonds of sensuality really are, the origin and the passing away, gratification, danger, escape, okay, origin and passing away, gratification, danger, 
and escape. In regard to sensual pleasures, when the one does not understand these things as they really are, then all these problems will happen. I will elaborate later. This is con called the bond of sensuality. Now, the translation is taken from Pante Bhikkhu Bodhi. You see the word in blue. The, the black one is all the translated, the translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Sorry. These words are my input. This one here on ending, this is a word introduced by Ajahn Sujato. In some cases, you will find me introducing these blue words. I put them in because it's not wrong. It, it, it may help you. It may help for some of you. Those, the blue words may carry a, a, a meaning that you can better identify with. Okay. So here you see origin passing away, which is called ending. And then here you see danger. Ajahn Sujato's translation is drawback. The problem. The problem with having this. So what does, what does this sentence mean? First and foremost, you have to understand that when we keep using the word to understand something as they really are, to understand things as they really are, this is what it means. You have to understand along this framework. You have to look at your aggregates along this framework. Okay? Origin and passing away. So remember, uh, origin and passing away. Gratification. Danger. Escape. That's your framework. So what is origin and passing away? You see, if you look at your mind and you, and you observe how your mind works, for those of you who who are into meditation and you begin to very carefully uh, pay attention to a rising of craving, you may find that craving just keeps running on their own. Okay, now let's just take form. Your eye sees something very often, we will say, hey, there is this contact. When there is a contact, craving arises. Or aversion arises it's so fast. But why does it happen? The origin of that is not the aversion or the, or the craving. The origin of that is actually ignorance. Your ignorance of the noble truths. In other words, there is a part in us that when we see things, hear things, smell things, there is a part in us that actually do not pay attention to dukkha. When we engage anything, our engagement is driven by pleasure, the sense of delight of pleasure. Okay? And when your, your engagement starts from the premise of pleasure, that in itself, this whole notion in itself, it's already arbitrary, ignorance. And from this anger of, I am engaging something in anticipation of delight, all of us have this problem. Huh? When you're not mindful and when you engage something, it's always from the angle of delighting, pleasure or aversion. I don't want to engage because I'm averse to it. This is a normal person's habit. So the mind is never in connection with, with remembering the noble truth. The mind doesn't, doesn't remember. The mind just run. So when that happens, your formation will run along that line. And it will run all the way to, you know, you have your contact, then you have your engagement, and it goes on. So many of us, when we engage anything, from the perspective, from the origin, 
of ignorance, we get caught up and it spins. Okay? That is one problem. The second problem is all this spinning is impermanent, but we don't see it. We engage and we're very happy. We will get fixated with it, perceiving not impermanence, perceiving that this is a lasting experience and it goes on. So to understand things as they really are, right at the start when there is an engagement, your mind has to stay with the noble truths. So when you see and there is an understanding, the moment you see and you note that and it has the noble truth as your baseline, then it is passing away. If noble truth is not your baseline, it is the origin. It starts. Do you understand? Dependent origination starts. If you, if you, when you see something, and at the baseline, it is the noble truth. It's a passing away. There is no starting already. I'm not sure if you all, you, you get me on this. Let me repeat. Uh. When you engage something, okay? If your eyes see a form and there is mindfulness, when there is mindfulness, you, you see the form and you know if you are attached, there is dukkha. If you are not attached, there is no dukkha. If you have that, the, the, the exp it's a passing away sensation. But if you do not have the noble truth as part of your baseline, the moment you see, you will run. This is your origin. It starts already. You, you, do you get this point? Do you understand this part? Now, Understanding and engagement as they really are means you must know how it starts and it runs into dukkha or how it doesn't run into dukkha. Okay? Gratification is, see, uh, if it's origin, origin means with ignorance as the start point, there is this interaction. In the interaction, you're mindless, right? So you have your ignorance, your shankara, your uh, vinyana, nama rupa. You just go on. You will have contact, which is the part that people are aware of. It's the feeling, the vedana that comes up. With that vedana, contact vedana, this will be the point when you experience pleasure or not. To see an experience from the angle of gratification is when you say, if I don't have the noble truth as part of my baseline, I will want to enjoy the experience. That's why it says gratification, relishing the pleasure and the joy. You must then be aware that when there is this pleasure, Pleasure will then be the condition for craving and attachment. With craving and attachment, it will be the condition for unwholesome conduct. If you constantly have unwholesome conduct, at the end of this life, it will lead to a rebirth in a lower destinations. In lower destinations. The danger of mindlessly chasing after delight and pleasure is that you, the individual who is mindlessly enjoying and seeking pleasure, may be so caught up in enjoyment that he forget to restrain, to act with restraint, with result, with which which will result in, therefore, saying the things just like that or whacking out just like that or just mindlessly enjoying at the, uh, uh, causing pain and suffering and, and problems for others. He doesn't care because he is mindlessly pursuing the pleasure. So what is danger? He will end up in a worse rebirth. What is danger? So uh, 
you have the gratification, gratification you enjoy. The problem with that is you're mindless in your pursuit. You may then resort to unwholesome behavior, speech, conduct, act, mind even, because you plan, plan, plan on how to enjoy. And this becomes a habit. And if this becomes a habit, the result is jalat ready. Towards the end of life, very problematic. Okay? And what is the escape? The only, mind you, the only escape is removal, abandoning of desire and last that craving. As I've said, the actual understanding that framework is not difficult. The difficulty is can you remember to do it in your daily life? Okay. I will repeat this because this framework actually appears for all of them except for the last one. For Kama Yoga, Bawa Yoga, Diti Yoga, this framework will appear. It's consistent. Except for Avicca, something, something else pops up. And the first one, origin and passing away, this always pops up. People wonder, what is this? This one, you really get to look at your mind. Whether or not, at the start point, is your instinct, is your training, such that when you experience when you come, when you have an experience, karma yoga is the one where you interact with the external world through your sense bases. When you have that experience, right at the start, it's vulnerable through constantly a feature in your mind. If it is not a feature in your mind, you already start with avicca. If it is a feature in your mind, you will not have you will not have the shankara that runs towards dukkha. Your construction is not towards dukkha. What does it mean? I'll give you say a life example. And it's just, just I try, uh, as I said, I'll try. Look at a real life example. You see someone you like, and you have you don't have the noble truth as your baseline. You see someone you like, the first sensation you're aware of is pleasure, which means contact has already happened. Do you understand? You see someone you like, your first, your first experience of that is not sight. Your first conscious experience of it is pleasure, which means a lot of things has already happened, you know, and you don't know it your aggregates have already started engaging and you don't know it. Therefore, in this practice, you have to become so aware of the noble truths that in any engagement, your baseline start point is if there is pleasure, means there is craving, it means this is problematic, there is dukkha. You, 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 you keep having this as part of your baseline, a point will come when you will see seeing only. You actually don't have that arising so fast. Or even if there is a pleasure, there is still a knowing that, oh, any attachment is to occur. I learn to manage attachment. Otherwise, it will spin. So the origin of any Binding, the origin of any binding is ignorance and craving. Those are your start points. Ignorance is your first start point. Craving will just lead you on and on. It will continue. Okay? And if you want, and in your practice, practitioner, you have to keep reminding yourself about this. My start point, I have to be very mindful that when there is 
craving, there is dukkha. When there is craving, there is dukkha. Therefore, there is this need to let the dukkha, uh, let the craving be. Let the craving be. Okay? You understand this part, huh? Because the second one, oh, then it goes on. The Buddha said, when one does not understand these things as they really are, you look at how many adjectives and how many, how many, I don't know what these are, um, words, thesaurus words almost to describe attachment, but they are not, they are not really thesaurus. They are actual very subtle description of attachment. The Buddha's mind is so sharp, he can list you. He can give you a list of what it feels like. From the most gross, last, where the, the, um, that holding is very tight, that sensation is very intense, to very deep level, very subtle even, very subtle twitch. He, he was able to describe them. Lust, delight, affection, infatuation, thirst, passion, attachment, craving. Different shades of attachment, different shades of pleasure derived or pain derived from each sensual experience. And the result of which is, he said, sensual craving, deep yearning, lie deep within one. How do you apply this? I will go into it later because subsequently he will also, he taught the monk how to break the cycle. Okay. So the same thing goes. And this one is even more complex. Bawa, Bawa Yoga, born of existence. Ban, uh, Ajahn Sujato called it rebirth. This translation was done by Bhikkhu Bodhi, existence. But Ajahn Sujato called it rebirth, becoming. Okay? And Buddha mentioned in a separate sutta, he mentioned, that there are three planes of existence, karma, rupa, arupa. This is really the different levels. Rupa, arupa, different heavenly realms. Huh? And karma is the realm that deals with sense, form, form experiences. So this is not human only. Eh? And in the Bhava Sutta, Anguttara Nikaya 3.76, the Buddha said, beings hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving. Kama is the feel, consciousness the seed, craving the moisture for consciousness to be established. Isn't it beautiful? Hindered by ignorance, you don't even know you don't know. This ignorance is ignorance of the Four Noble Truth. Fettered by craving, you are chained, you are bonded, you don't even know. Okay? You don't know that you are having craving as a fetter, by the way. Eh? The regular mind that brain this um, person, the regular being doesn't know that. Karma is the feel, is the expression of life. Consciousness, the seed, that's you. And how it sprout, it sprout in the, the, ex, the, the feel of your life. And this craving, the moisture, it keeps the thing going. Because the seed without moisture is finished. So it is your craving that keeps watering this plant and making it grow. 
So this time round, I, I specifically point out that in the origin and possible, it's still ignorant. Eh? The origin is still ignorant, but specifically I pull out these two words, upadana, which is clinging, and bawa, which is becoming. So basically what happened is that a being at the point of death, has, if he has not learned how to let go of craving, he wouldn't know how to do it at the end. So at his deathbed, the instinct is still to want and to hold tightly. So upadana is cling. Craving is to want. Clinging is to hold tightly. There is a difference. Upadana is far more intense. It's stronger craving. Intense and stronger. And it's that I won, I won, I won. And that, that very tense gripping will spring another life, will spring another birth. Okay? Gratification is still the same. You see, the regular person enjoys life. The reason why we enjoy life is actually because the two are conjoined. Huh? We perceive life as the opportunity to experience. You experience six sense base, not five. This one has six sense base. That five pertaining to your engagements with the external world and the mind. So Bauer is six sense base. The five pertaining to the external world and the six is the mind. The mind is the one that really wants to enjoy. It, so it, it goes out and it engages and then it brings it back into the mind and oh, let's relish it. And all six sense beings fully appreciate pleasure and joy. And it's therefore strongly averse to pain and suffering. These two come together. Why is Bauer a danger? Because as long as there is birth, there will be aging, dying, and death. And a whole mess of suffering. This is not funny. Not funny because in life, we are so caught up with temporary, transient, persistent enjoyment. We keep recreating pleasure and joy and enjoyment. We don't realize that everything has an end game in this life. There will be aging, which is not easy. There will be dying, which is even harder. And there will be the separation of death. Those are extreme dukkha. Nobody, nobody who has not realized will be spared from the sense of pain at separation. How intensely you feel depends on your own practice. From the ones that cry buckets, cry swimming pools to the ones who silently weep but it will be there so as long as there is birth there will be death but yet yet we want rebirth the average regular person want rebirth because we are still anticipation anticipating pleasure and joy we still want that. And the same thing, in order to escape, craving and clinging has to drop completely. Completely. I, I retain this sentence here, if there were no karma ripening in the world, in the realms, would existence be discerned? This one is actually an exchange between Buddha and Ananda. 
And Buddha was making the point that there is such a thing as existence. And it is karma, your, your choices. It is the choices that you make that lead to existence. Okay? Let me make sure that... Okay. This one. Diti Yoga. I have given talks on DT uh, views, but this part has two components here. There is the self-identity view, the view where you perceive the world as true and established meaning. Uh, the regular view, the regular mind view, perceive the world as permanent when the reality is, is impermanent. Perceive the world as pleasure, pleasant, pleasurable, when in reality it is dukkha. Perceive the world as self, when in reality it is non-self. And perceive the world as beautiful attractive when in reality it is not it is ugly it is repulsive so there is this issue and then the second one has to do with perceiving all the aggregates form feeling perception volitional formation consciousness perceiving these aggregates as self as possessing self, as in self, self and these guys. I have given very extensive talks on this, so I won't go into detail here, okay? But this, why, why are these views, these kind of things important? Because actually, in the way that we look at life and the world, whether it's about yourself and the world or when you are judging another, when you're seeing other people and you look at them and say that this person behaved like this, he's not a nice person, you, you blame, you are judgmental. All this goes back to a certain way of seeing things and saying things. As I've said, for details, you can watch the other talk that I've given. It's called Sabha Azava with a Buddhist fellowship. Okay? This is one kind of view. But there is another kind of views, which is basically the views that we all hold about things. And if you look at your own mind, why do you hold views like that? What you will actually find that there is a when you when you articulate an opinion. Uh, when you articulate an opinion, that articulation also can bring you pleasure. Or when someone's opinion differs from you, you also don't like it and you will question. And before you know it, there can be altercation between the two. I have a view, you have a view, we don't agree, we fight. Right? This is also view. This is DT also. And I'm going to talk about the second type because if you look at your views, the views that we hold, sometimes those views are basically an expression of self. Self is actually an expression of your own craving, your own wanting. Because views give you pleasure. It can give you pain if someone disagrees with you, but actually, you go on and on talking, it actually gives you pleasure. You enjoy it. That's the gratification. You don't believe, huh? you just sit amongst friends and people start talking. You find that they like to talk about themselves. They like to share their opinion. They, they have, and, and as they share their opinion, they get louder and louder and happier and happier. Actually, all these views are affirmation of self self and they can be very powerful very powerful affirmation 
Okay, and why why are they so? Uh, you you sometimes hold them so tightly because they are about you. Why that? <laughs> because they actually give you a lot of pleasure. You think about it. Would these scholars coming together have a lot of views? Buddhists, Buddhists, you don't even talk about you and other faith and religion. You yourself, different traditions, you also fight, also got views. It makes you feel good and you argue till the cow comes home. Cows come home, got milk, left for work, the next day still arguing. And it's the same thing. Even anything, anything that one derives pleasure in, that one derives pleasure in is a source of danger because as long as you derive pleasure, you will crave, you will cling. There will be attachment. For views, it is attachment to the idea of a self. It's an idea of a self, but it becomes so real. So you will literally be churning your own delusion. Views causing us to have deeper delusion of self. Again, the escape is letting go view. Every time we are able to set aside an opinion. Every time you can set aside an opinion, you will find the craving and clinging soften, drops. At that moment, you have one tactical escape from a clinging. It's a tactical one. At a far more strategic level, you really have to keep letting go accepting, agreeing, be content with all kinds of things from your, your experience of life to the, the views that you create in yourself to uh, that sense of wanting to be this or be that. Every single, every single source, source of pleasure you have to put that aside. These are the, these are the sources of pleasure. These are the, the avenues, the objects where you one derives pleasure from. And the escape is to let go of, not the object, is to let go of the clinging to an object or the craving for an object. It's the craving, it's the mental energy of craving. So that's why it's the abandoning of desire and wanting. I know the word has been translated as last, but it's actually one thing. So however strong your one thing, it becomes last. If it's not so strong, it becomes one thing. If it's even milder, maybe a preference, a subtle preference. It's different shades of craving. You actually have to let that craving be in order to drop it. And the final one I said is a bit different from the others. The final one is ignorance, right? It's ignorance. Ignorance. So I kept the whole thing. Someone does not understand as they really are origin and the passing away, gratification, danger, escape in regard to six bases for contact. This level of practice you actually catch it when the mind becomes first aware of the object. This is actually all the other six bases for contact is that first moment when the mind becomes aware of an object. And that object can be karma, the object can be bower, the object can be DT, because DT is the mind object, right? Bauer is mind object. Kama is all your five other sense bases. And all of them, there is a contact. 
So you literally will be looking at the mind when it becomes first aware of the object. Know the origin means when you see the object, again, remember the baseline, noble truths, whatever object that you derive pleasure from is a source for dukkha. You have that as your baseline, you are aware of origin. You don't have that as your baseline, you will really run into dukkha. Okay? And I said, why this? Because con contact is conditioned for feelings, which is conditioned for craving, then clinging and becoming. I, I, I got tired writing the same thing again and again, so I just sum it out as gratification, danger, and escape. It's the same principle. So in the practice, you literally become at the point when the object you become aware of, and you must then, when you are aware of the object, you have to be aware of whether your mind seeks out the object or not. If it seeks out the object, you, you must be very careful. You, it's either you have, you're ignorant, so you do not know about the noble truth, or if you are a practitioner, which you are supposed to know about the noble truth, that's when you hold the line and say, it's okay, I don't have to pray for this. I am not craving for this. I'm just aware, aware of how the mind can run and aware of how the mind can don't run, don't go towards the object. Okay? And why is this a bond of ignorance? Because even when we think, even when we think we know the noble truths, it doesn't mean that when you have that awareness, you have that contact, your mind wants, wants to follow the teaching, which means to let go. It may well be that your mind still wants to go after that pleasure. And that means you are still tied down by that ignorance. So even though you understand, you're still very tiki. Refuse to do as the teaching prescribed. Tiki, ah, tiki, you know, ah? metal teeth. Stubborn. You still want to. You say, it's okay. Like if you, if you ever find yourself saying this, it's okay. I only have to taste it once. It's okay. What harm can a little taste be? If you find yourself saying things like that, this is the bond of ignorance. This is where you're tied up by ignorance. And many of us, lay people, are like that. No? We, 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 we were not tied down by this one. Because we we'll say, it's okay. La. Never mind, I practice so hard already today. Never mind, I just enjoy. We, we indulge. Ah, this, this is the one. Born of ignorance. Okay? One is fettered. Now, so this is the bonds. When you have the bonds, one is fettered by unwholesome states that is defiling, conducive to renewed existence, troublesome, ripening in suffering, leading to future birth, old age, and death. Therefore, one is said to be not secured from bondage. So, earlier on, he said, know the origin, the ending, passing away, gratification, danger, escape, they are all here. This is a summary. Okay? I told you earlier the danger, the, the gratification is when you go and enjoy it. The danger is when you, you get addicted and then you may, in fact, you're likely to end up having unwholesome states. And the result of which is renewed existence, troublesome, ripening in suffering, etc., etc. And the escape is when you can drop that craving. So I sum it up as the battery of life, that which keeps you going through samsara, are the two critical elements, ignorance 
and crazy. Ignorance of the noble truths in so far as it is not that you don't know, you know, but you don't realize how critically important it is to be very meticulous in how you apply as a baseline lens applying the noble truth as a baseline lens every time you look at the world every time there is an interaction you must be very careful for noble truths when there is craving there is dukkha when you do not have craving dukkha ceases you are aware of that so you manage the preferencing you manage the craving you carefully manage so that you don't get caught up. But if your mind is caught up, it's not mindful of the noble truths, you can see how fast your mind will spin. Dependent origination. I know people will go, avidya pachaya sankara, sankara pachaya vinyana, vinyana pachaya nama rupa, nama rupa pachaya salayatana. Right? You go on like this. What are these? Aggregates. You don't know any better, forget it. They're all aggregates. The moment the mind lacks that awareness, what you will have is all your aggregates get trapped ready. It is into grasping. If you have awareness of the noble truths and you, you very steadily hold the line on craving, all your aggregates are not being grasped. That's actually what it means. You do not grab, grip onto your aggregates. Okay? And when you are not grasping onto, you're not gripping onto your aggregate, there is the contact, but there is no dukkha. There is a sensation. Yes, it is normal. This is normal human being. There is that sensation. There's the way, then, but there is no dukkha. It doesn't lead to dukkha. So, Because of ignorance and craving, there will be an addiction to feeling. When there is an addiction to pleasure or aversion to pain, I sorry, addiction to feeling is addiction to pleasure, aversion to pain. These are the two extremes. When there is addiction to feeling, craving will be a given. You cannot help but experience craving. Because of craving as a condition, you will be in danger of committing or giving in to akusala, unwholesome mental states. For the regular mind, this is your samsara. This is how we get trapped. You samsara in one life, samsara between lives. We are trapped and we come again and again in dukkha. In dukkha. Because once you come again, it is a birth, there will be OH, ill health, dying, and death. There will be the people that you miss, you lose along the way. There will be people who will miss you and you feel bad being the one that have to go first, make transition first. It's inevitable. And until, until we are able to soften and eventually let go of that craving, abandon and relinquish, you literally dropped it. Until that can happen, that battery will keep going. It is a self-charging battery. Okay? Then comes part two. And I, I got lazy typing, so I had Tito. And it's the same thing. What is the severance of the bond of sexuality? And that's when you understand, as they really are, origin and passing away. I... Let me explain passing away a little bit more carefully. Eh? Origin, I told you, is that ignorant, which leads to 
dependent origination that 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 onward okay it will happen all the way to dukkha passing away actually is the reverse when there is no ignorance then there is no shankara it, the the no the no ignorance is the condition for cessation of shankara which is the condition for the cessation of vinyana and it goes on meaning things starts to stop your when when you have that for those who practice and go on retreat for instance uh, this is a life real life experience uh, you go for a retreat and then you become very aware of that mindfulness is so clear so in that mindfulness you find that you are constantly mindful of the noble truths so when you have that state mind you're constantly aware that if there is craving there is dukkha when there is no craving there's cessation of dukkha when that is your mental state then you find that you don't crave so you don't experience dukkha you can have your contact you can have your your uh vedana vinyana you can have everything but there isn't dukkha why because you're very mindful of the noble truths severance of the bond of sensuality means right into your experience of the sense senses your interaction your what you see what you hear what you smell taste touch in that experiences you know you you if you have any attachment it's going to be painful so you don't have it you start to make do you do not crave instead you accept you are content you don't mind anything after a while you are equanimous with regards to the sense pleasure when you have equanimity with regards to sense pleasure you are severing the bond of sensuality if you have equanimity absolute equanimity with regards to the becoming because if you if you have absolute equanimity to sense pleasure you will have very strong equanimity towards becoming existence now this is sense pleasure with regards to existence there's still the mind meaning some people they they don't have craving for for the sensual world but they love the meditation they absolutely enjoy their jhanas that is still holding on to okay that's holding on to the jhanas holding on to meditation so the severance for existence it goes into that level also it doesn't even cling to pleasure or the joy of meditation it, it, it they don't hold that anymore so neither pleasure and delight and attachment to sensual world no pleasure delight and attachment to the mental world they will cut the existence and of course if you are very equanimous about views thoughts arising views arising you very equanimous you don't hold on to anything you don't mind anything at uh, that one also that's where you cut the bond to views okay in regard to the six basis for contact let me explain this a little huh? six basis of contact literally means the world okay because without contact that when there is no contact there is no world so that contact is when it's when the world will begin whether it's a physical world a sensual world or mental world right mind made object so the practice here is to the level that the individual doesn't even land he doesn't even hold on to contact any of the six same basis contact and he's therefore his vidya his vidya is so clear there is zero holding on to anything anything the moment there is a contact something has landed the 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 awareness will start 
there is no, there is not even contact. So there's no Vedana, there is no, there is no um, uh, perception. With no Vedana, no Sanya. It doesn't even land. Okay. One is detached from bad unwholesome states that are defiling, conducive to renewed existence, troublesome, ripening and suffering, leading to future birth, old age and death. Therefore, one is said to be secure from bondage. So I say no ignorance, no, illusion, no delusion about danger of six bases of contact. When you have zero ignorance about the noble truths, when there is clarity, you see, how do the noble truths and the tilakana connect? Eh? If, you, if you know Buddhist history, you will know that Buddha delivered Dhamma Chakra first, which is on the Four Noble Truths. Right? And following the delivery of Dhamma Chakra, uh, Kondanya, ascetic Kondanya, entered the street. You all know that, right? But the others all couldn't make it. They, they were still blur. Eh? Then, after a few days of teaching them, he delivered the second one, which is called Anatta Lakana Sutta, and all of them got it. All of them realized Arahan, right? You all know this. And the second one, Anatta Lakana, is the one that today we know it as impermanent, dukkha, and non self. So what it means is this. If you cannot fully appreciate the noble truths, kind of quite connected, then you take it one step earlier and say, look at the nature of all your engagements, from the form to the feeling, to your, con your uh, perception, to thought formation, to consciousness. You look at all of these aggregates and perceive in all these aggregates the impermanence because impermanent you can see you know you stare hard enough it's jump it jumps at you when you perceive that impermanence you will realize that all experiences that you cling so hard onto those experiences they are impermanent therefore they are not stable they are not satisfactory. Why? Because when you seek pleasure, don't you hope that pleasure will last? When one seek pleasure, you want lasting pleasure. Why do you want an impermanent pleasure? Every time you enjoy something, you want it to be lasting. Why, how, how, what good does it do if it's only impermanent? Split second pleasure. What's so short about it? So, the idea here is if you keep getting smacked on the head that your sense of pleasure is very temporary, very temporary, very temporary, at some point it will dawn on you that all these temporary pleasure are so meaningless. That's why it's bosh, bosong, not satisfactory, not at all satisfactory, right? I mean, you look at it, you get addicted to cigarette. Not that I smoke, I don't smoke. But let's say you are addicted to cigarette. But really, that's it. Spend another how many dollars to buy another box of cigarette. It's so unsatisfactory. And if you look at all these unsatisfactory moments, it may dawn on the person that, hey, I have no control, eh? I, I have no control over all these experiences. I believe I have control. But the reality is I have no control. If I have no control, what does it say about that self, that permanent being that is supposed to be forever and has all the glorious features of forever don't have all you have is just constant evolving sensations so if someone becomes fully cognizant of impermanence dukkha at some point another becomes a 
it more evident, okay? And that is when this individual begin to let go, begin to not have so much hangouts. When he no longer has that degree of holding on and hanging up, when he no longer have that, has that, that is when he realized the noble truths. When you hold and you crave, it is dukkha. When you don't hold and you don't crave, that is cessation of dukkha. This is when he becomes aware that the noble truths are for real. It is as the Buddha had explained it. You see the connection now? When you can have this degree of understanding, your ignorance drops, right? It starts to get diminished. You have no more delusion. Delusion is with regards to the, the anicca, dukkha, anatta. You have no more delusion. You now know that your six bases of contact are the source of your pleasure and therefore your, your weight are your pleasure and therefore your craving and your clinging, they are problematic. You become aware of that. And you're constantly staring at this in the face, you will develop an equanimity towards feeling. It's the same again and again and again and again. You experience pleasure, then the end of it, pleasure and the end of it, it is so disappointing. It, it's never satisfactory. It's never good enough. You must have that wisdom to see it. That is why this practice requires that there must be understanding. There must be vijja, knowledge. Because if you don't understand and you have no knowledge, you can be very tired, but you still do it. You can be then fed up that your feelings are so temporary, but you still want to do it. You still want it. It's only when you become very aware that this is the entire nature of existence. You like it and not this is never ever going to go away. It is temporary. It is conditional. And as long as you crave, you're going to experience dukkha. And you can come again and again and again, different lives, and you're going to die again and again and again. And it's never going to change. It's when you become so clear as to the meaninglessness of coming again that you start to be able to not crave to come again. That is why you have understanding wisdom. Eventually, this will happen. Equanimity towards feeling. Meaning whether there is enjoyment or not, you are not particular about that. It is not that you no longer enjoy. If you taste something pleasant, you still know in your mind this is pleasant. You taste something that is awful and you, that is the... You still have the sensation that this is not pleasant. But what you don't have is aversion, ill will. You don't have that. It's just, oh yeah, mm, this one is a bit funny. But that's it. There, there isn't the extreme. Okay? When you develop equanimity towards feeling, then, only then, it is possible for dukkha, for craving, sorry, for craving to drop. So that's why it's called cessation of craving. You can have cessation of craving, you are secure from, you are secure from bondage. You can have cessation of craving, you will be secured from bondage. Okay? This is, to me, the most beautiful part of this sutta. It's a summary of the teaching, fettered by the bond of sensuality and the bond of existence, fettered by the bond of views, preceded by ignorance, beings go on in samsara, led on in birth and death. See? Preceded by ignorance, the origin of all the fetters. Okay? But having entirely understood sense pleasures, 
noble truths, eh? no more ignorance, sense pleasures, the bond of existence, having uprooted the bond of views and dissolved ignorance, they have severed all bonds, gone beyond bondage. So to be able to go beyond bondage, one has to have clarity, clear understanding, deep appreciation, no mistake, huh? deep appreciation of the noble truths to the point that it becomes almost second nature. Actually, not almost, uh, second nature. It's your baseline, the baseline lens, such that every time you look at any sense pleasure, look at becoming, every time there is a view that arises in you, you look at all these things and in your mind, your instinct is, don't hold, let be. Because if you hold, this is dukkha. This habit has to become second nature. And then the craving will start to drop spontaneously. Okay? Okay. I, sorry, not yet. Now we look at question. Many questions. Let me see. If a person could abandon desire and lust, how would he or she live his daily life? What would she do every day? If you can abandon desire and lust, you will live with the freest of mind, absolute lightness and liberation. You don't have to do anything. You are just happy like a luck every day, every moment. Because we experience dukkha because of craving. If there were no craving, there is no dukkha. If you have no craving, you have zero dukkha. Can you just imagine how light that mind is? There was this beautiful little story. I, I must have repeated this story like 20,000 times. But there is this beautiful, which I love very much. There is this cousin of the Buddha. He was a cousin of the Buddha. One of the Sakyans, his cousin, who joined the order. And this cousin took his, he, he was once, he once chaired the Sakyan Tribal Council, okay? Sakyan, you must know that the Sakyan is a tribal council. Eh? The, the governing body of the Sakyan is a, diplomacy, uh, is a democracy. The heads of the various Sakyan families will come together, sit around this round table and they debate. Eh? That, that's what they do. And this cousin, used to be one of them. And he ordained, joined the Buddha and practiced. He practiced so well, he became an arahan. Cessation of desire and lust. Okay? He, he, he had no more of that. And then he started being very pleased and he was merrily going, so blissful, so blissful. And then the other monks heard and they went to complain to the Buddha. They say, this guy, this guy, your cousin, your cousin, is enjoying himself, they said to the Buddha. He is experiencing pleasure. He's enjoying himself. Bad practitioner. Buddha then said, okay, come, come. Come, cousin, come. I forgot his name, I swear his cousin. Come, cousin. Can you please explain to them what was going on? So he said in the past, when he was the leader of, in, in the Sakyan community, he had guards posted outside of his bedroom, so he was protected. But he felt so burdened, burdened, could take it. But now that he is a monk and he had realized Nibbana, his mind was so light. He was so happy. He was having the, the time of his life. The mind was so light and happy and joyous. So that's all he was, 
He said, that's, that's all. <laughs> it's bliss. So you can imagine the kind of bliss that goes through a mind that has no factors. Let me explain something about factors. You look at your own life. Do you, would you say that your own, your own life, right, you are concerned about how people see you? You are concerned about how you look, how you look to society, whether people like you or not. Do you, do you have that? Huh? You, you know that, right? You feel that. Are you concerned about, hey, am I doing the right thing? Should I be doing this? Maybe I should be doing that. Are, are you concerned about that? Huh? There's some elements of social compliance of sort. Huh? Social compliance. And then if you're a practitioner, you may also be saying, yeah, maybe this is how I should be practicing. Or maybe it should be like that. And, and, am I doing it correct or not? Maybe I'm doing it wrong. Do, do, you, do you experience something like that? You have this, huh? and then you say, "Okay, I, Buddha said to train for, to be a good person. I will train. I will train." And then you do some things. And I must do this. I must drop this. I must not eat that. I must not do this. I must be vegetarian. And you go on and on and on. There's a lot of I must. I must. I must not. I must not. Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. And then you find that in your life, there is this grappling constantly with pleasure and fear, aversion to pain. Do you have that? No need to be so shy. La. We all have that. We all have preferences. Now, but I want you to look at your own mind. In the daily life, moment to moment as you go through life, did your mind keep going, I, I prefer it like that. No, no, I like it like that. Why are they doing it like this? This is making things very difficult for me. So there is judging and there is fear of being judged and there is const constant toggling between I like, I don't like, I like, I don't like. And this is not big light or small lights. Huh? I mean, this is, this is any lights or not like. Down to, I hope the bus comes now. Am I late for appointment? You just go through your life. How many burden do you have in a day? And then there is that comparison Huh? There's this comparison, there's this restlessness. Da, 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 da. I'm describing a person's life, right? In a day, right? What do you think they are? They are factors. Your 10 factors, they are the 10 factors of life. Imagine for a moment when all of these factors no longer feature in your life. They don't feature at all. Happiness, not happiness, pain, no pain, nothing. You don't feel a thing. You're equanimous. Absolutely equanimous. Nice or not? not bad. What will he do every day? Whatever he has to do. There is no planning. There is no need to plan. You see, this question is posed with an assumption of the regular mind. So the regular mind is shackled, is burdened. A mind that is not shackled, that is not burdened, is not a regular mind. It doesn't have the same kind of weight. And therefore, it's like as a helium balloon on a good day. It's very light, okay? Origin arising are different. Origin is the cause. Arising is the beginner, beginning of the phenomenon. Sure. Sure. But what's the, you know... I, I, I understand where this question is coming from. But let me put it this way. When you're staring at your mind and you're a bit fuzzy as to, to what's going on, whatever that you spot as the, become, at the, as the beginning, for you, that's the origin, right? That's the first point. Then let that be. La. Whatever is the description of the word, it is not important. The important Thing, really 
is when you observe whatever that you observe, at that point when you observe it, did you catch Dukkha? Did you catch the feeling? The feeling. Whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, or neither nor. If it's just not pleasant or not unpleasant, it's that middle one. If you caught it, did you notice whether there is craving or not? Whether you call it origin or arising to you is just a concept. It's an idea. And an idea can help, may not help, I don't know. It really depends on your practice. My advice to you is focus really on that craving that appears. It's contact, there is a craving. Look at how the mind ends up in a state where that craving keeps coming up. And you put into practice what I just said. If you're very mindful, very aware of the noble truths as a sandwich, very aware of it huh? as a sandwich, when you're very aware, as you engage the world outside or inside, do you experience dukkha? If you say, not so much. Correct? If you say, uh, I still experience it. Oh, no, no, no. Look some more. I will say, just look some more. Be even more aware. Make the noble truths literally as your baseline lens. When you make it as a baseline lens, what will happen is your sense of wanting and craving will start to diminish. It will start to diminish. You will start to feel better. Okay? Dharma presents views such as the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, Three Characteristics of Existence, etc. of seeing reality. How could we practice without holding so strongly to the views that they become a bond of views? Oh, that's very good. That's a very good question. They are a view only if they remain concepts, meaning ideas. They are no longer a view when you become, when you become aware of these not as teachings and ideas, but really as something you witness in your observation of your minds. When you are observing, I'm talking about life, real-time, real-time observation, real-time eyewitness observation. When you are observing it in real time, what you will experience is a sense that what you are seeing and what he had taught that you understood, they correlate, they are the same. They say it like that. I'm seeing it like this. They are the same. What you want to remember, internalize, is the part that you see. Not just the words, really what you saw. Because what you see will then become lock in there and shape your outlook. Ideas per se, knowledge per se, without having been personally tasted, experienced and tasted for yourself, is just knowledge. The day, like, I always say that, say for example, just as, as an example, say, Impermanence, right? And I've always said impermanence at the start point is about mortality, right? The day that you become very aware of your own mortality is the day you become very aware of impermanence. As he had said it. 
if your head remains in the sand, like the ostrich, in case you don't know the analogy, yeah? so rude. If your head remains in the sand with regards to mortality, and so in your mind you say, I will, I am, uh, I, I am, um, I will die, you know, I, 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 I have not overcome that condition of dying and death, right? If you see something like that, it's just words. They are just thoughts. Until such time when you realize, whether because someone you love passed on, or you yourself have been told that you are terminally ill, or you see for yourself someone right before, in front of you, just collapse and die, that kind of an impact and you correlate to the Dhamma, that's when you will remember. And that's not a view. It's no longer just a view or a thought. That's seared into your mind so deeply. It is now your lens. And that's what you want. That's what you must have. Because the idea here is not to stop at impermanence. The idea here is to get your lens to change to the point that letting go, accepting, accepting contentment becomes second nature. Okay? Contentment, accepting, letting go must become second nature. If they are not second nature, then there will still be the becoming, the becoming, the becoming. It will still be like that. Okay? Easy, it is easy to moderate craving when it comes to pleasurable things than it is, than it is to moderate aversion to painful things such as arrogant people. Does it mean we still have to face up to nasty people? Well, for you, it's easy to moderate craving. <laughs> Some people find it very hard to moderate craving. When you, ex when you find that there is still aversion, it actually means there is still preferences. It still means that there is crave there's still craving. You may moderate craving in terms of the number of things. So let's say in the past, 1,001 things can get you craving, can trigger that one thing, the pleasure, the sense of pleasure. Today is down to three. <laughs> From 1,001 to three. Beautiful. But you still got three. The fact that you still have three means there is aversion. You have to have no craving. It, not three. Zero. It must be zero. Zero. Then there is no more aversion. Otherwise, if you say, yes, I... Your, what actually it means is, I don't find myself craving a lot, but I still find myself having a rising of agitation and anger. And I'm saying that as long as there is an arising of agitation and anger, craving as a latent tendency is there. And the strength of that agitation will tell you the strength of your latent craving. You haven't come across something that you really like, so you think you are okay. But actually, it is there. Okay? It is like, there was this cute other story, which I've never talked about before, so you're hearing a story for the first time. There was this lady in the Buddhist time who was well known for her patience. Super Pakanti auntie, this very patient lady. And she had a maid, a domestic help, who was said, who was said, I, I have a question about, but she was said to be a good practitioner. And she decided to put her lady boss to the test, which she did. Day one, lady boss held her anger. Kanti, kanti. She pushed a bit harder. Day two, lady boss still hold her tongue. Kanti, kanti. Everybody, oh, and he's very patient. Day three, day four, I don't know how many days she tested, but one day, lady boss gave it to her, started smacking her. 
she basically just blew it. it is, this is really a case where the guy just caved her, her the, the straw that broke the that broke the can the camel's back, and she went after this this domestic hell and whacked the lady. So this the 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 moral of the story is, you don't know until something really matters, then we know. Okay. So that's, that's just a cute little story. Doesn't that mean we still have to face up to nasty people? You know, the more, the more there is acceptance as a mental condition, the more the mind has learned not to be partial towards preferences and learn moderation in the absolute term. It is accepting. It is this. Just really, really, that becomes second nature. The more that happens, the more likely that you become you become equanimous towards behavior. Meaning to say, the kind of behavior that will trigger agitation in you will reduce. The, the, the intensity, meaning your threshold starts to climb. You is it climb, right? You, you get more and more tolerant. You're more and more able to accept whatever nonsense, right? What it means is you become less judgmental. You will become less judgmental. You will become more accepting with all kinds of behavior. So you will not be saying nasty people. You may be just saying, oh, wow, strange. Yeah? Your, the words that you use, right? The adjective that you use become more and more generic and less and less specific. The more specific your adjective, the more layers of dif differentiation and discrimination, the more layers that you have, the more your mind is nitpicking the more accepting you are of people's behavior, the more generic you'll find yourself to be and the less judgmental your description. So you ask me whether, how, how do you know whether you are improving or you are regressing? You look at your colorful vocabulary. The more colorful, the less likely you are progressing. The more bland, the more blend, it doesn't mean that you're losing words. It merely means that you are okay. You're more and more okay with things around you. Okay? You bear this in mind. Huh? If you don't believe me, today you sit down and you write all the adjectives that you have. And one year from now, after tremendous effort and practice, you go and see how many you remember. Ah, then you have an empirical evidence read. <laughs> okay. Don't take me seriously all the time. Huh? Are we supposed to live like robots, not reacting to feelings? Does one become rudeless without views? I love these questions. You see how you judge? People without feelings are robots. You're already judged, right? That's because in our mind, we have certain assumptions. Humans have range of feelings, range of emotions, and the reacting to the world in the various ways, the various discriminated ways, is a reflection of humanity, your humanness. That is true. But we are lifting towards no noble being, right? We are rising above humanity. You're, in our practice, we are not interested in being human. Been that, done that. We are interested in being nobler, more noble, less emotional, more equanimous. You cannot say equanimity is feelingless. Less. Equanimity in its purest sense 
is about the most beautiful of sensations. You say hey, equanimity doesn't sound fun. No. The purest of equanimity, the Brahma Vihara of equanimity has no attachment, has no discrimination, is Brahma Vihara. It's all embracing. So equanimity as a mental state is total acceptance. Total acceptance. No discrimination. A mind that totally accepts whatever, meaning he's absolutely content, huh? a mind that accepts whatever is a very joyous mind. Very light, very joyous. So you are not robot, but you're neither, you're neither human nor robot. You are Brahma the higher heavenly being. In that world, your experience is Mita, Karuna, Mudita, and now Upeka. It's beautiful. It's expensive. Not, not, not expensive. Expensive. It spreads, spreads out. It embraces. Can you imagine a mind that's like that? No discrimination. No, you, me, you, me, us. Brotherhood, uh, that, that kind. Not even brotherhood, but brotherhood is gender-based. It's all beings as one. So, oh, it's incredibly beautiful. You will know what I mean if you had done metta, meditation, properly. If you had done metta meditation the way that the Buddha taught, then somewhere down the line, you really will experience upeka. And that's where you realize that upeka is joyous. Upeka is not no feeling. It's very joyous. Okay? Does one become ruderless without view? Again, what does the word ruder mean? Huh? Ruder implies control. You want to steer, you want to control. And a regular mind, the conventional mind, wants to have control. The question is why? Why is it built into our instinct, this need to control? i tell you why. Because I know I cannot wait for an answer. I have to tell you why. The reason is this. You, we go, we, we, we want, remember we all, our start point is pleasure, no pain, no danger. You just spread it. No danger, no fear, all good, not bad. But we know as we grow up that the world it's not always so compliant with your desires. The world can be very hard. The world can be very painful. Sometimes you get what you want. Sometimes you don't get what you want. So the idea of control has to do with trying to shape, to maximize the outcome to your preference. Okay? The idea of control is to maximize whether it's comfort or pleasure, to try and maximize the condition in such a way that it will be to your preference. So control has to do with that, which means control has to do with desire for pleasure. It's very, you may not see, it, but this is there. And the result of that is, you want to shape your environment out there. Constantly wanting to shape the environment out there, shape behavior, shape the, the weather, so you, 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 you adjust the temperature. Then the too much sound, close all the windows, shape the sound environment. Then. You, you see what I'm saying? You may not realize it, but you are actually doing things to increase your comfort. Okay? Views, views are also a way to shape the environment to your comfort, to your preference, to your benefit. And that is why views clash. Views give you an assurance that you're okay. 
the views that you hold. But other people's views when they clash with yours, not okay. Then the fight will start. What will happen when you have no views? You're free. The world is comfortable. Regardless. Actually, that's what it will mean. If you have no preference and no fear, no need to shape, then you base. But it has to be instinctive, meaning there is a part in you that already doesn't mind. Doesn't mind anything, will accept anything, and will not react to anything. When that part of you become more pronounced, natural, uh, shape, it, it's natural. When it becomes more pronounced, what will happen is you become more comfortable with not controlling. Don't believe? I think many of you have children, right? And as they are growing up, you will be shaping the environment around them to keep them safe. But you don't do that to a child who is 20 years old or 15 years old or 10 years old. At some point, you stop pasting rubble all over the place and ensuring slip-free floor and that kind of thing, right? Don't put things into your mouth. You stop cleaning all the time, right? At some point, you stop worrying about controlling the environment. You start to let go. Why? Because you believe they know how to protect themselves. They will keep themselves safe. So you, you start to let be. You start to accept that it's safe to let them be. Then what does it happen? What happened to your mind? You feel freer. Right? This is a life experience. The more you feel you don't have to do anything, you are accepting of whatever happens, the freer you will feel. The more you constantly want to shape, it means you are nitpicking over people and environment. It means you're very insecure. You have very strong, intense preferences. And then you are constantly worried about how your environment can change to your disadvantage. So you become paranoid. You, we all know anyone who is paranoid has a lot of dukkha. But how come we don't know how to say that to ourselves? We know that, right? Everyone who's very paranoid experiences a lot of dukkha. But we don't say that to ourselves. Can you stop being so paranoid? Can you stop holding things so tightly? Can you let things be? We, we don't say that to ourselves. We think it's okay. We paranoid, okay. Other people paranoid cannot. See doctor, doctor cannot. There's something off here. So does one become ruderless without views? No. No need for rudel. You become free and happier. Okay? Why does the bond of sensuality... Ah, one more came in. Why does the bond of sensuality not include the mind base and its mind objects such as thoughts, ideas, since we could derive... Uh, Bauer is, uh, okay, becoming, but DT, lo? your ideas and thoughts are all DT. That's why I say DT has two versions. There is the DT, the bonds, which shackle you into a certain perspective about reality and about the self, about your, your, yourself. And there is the views that you keep throwing up about all kinds of things. And you're right. You derive pleasure from all these views and thoughts and ideas and so on and so forth. And those also you have to see origin. So what is saying origin? Know that ignorance, ignorance is churning the game. You are ignorant of the noble truth. So you're churning happily right at the start point. And therefore you're attached to your views. Let me ask you this. Huh? In reply to this. Actually not in reply to this. In reply to uh, as a baseline understanding. Let me ask you this. If you, if you, you, become very aware of non-self, 
you accept non-self, you see it all, you see all the aggregates, whether it's contact and Vedana, Vedana feeling, sensation, perception, and you, you, you have very little thinking, thinking, and you see the form and you become very aware that the form is just elements and it doesn't last. You see all of these as processes, okay? You become very aware that they are processes. And you, you don't cling on to these processes. Do you think you still have a lot of views? After all, if you are five aggregates and you are conditionally a reason five aggregates, others also conditionally a reason five aggregates. And holding on to views and all is actually dukkha. Others holding on also very dukkha. So you can see that they are very dukkha. If you see from this, you come from this angle, would you still be so particular about your views? Okay. And for those of you who are nodding your head, you know what I mean. So the more you understand the conditionally reason processes of reality, the less view you will cling on to. It's not that you have no views, but you have less. Every time you are aware of the noble truths, you drop the view. Every time you are caught up in the world and the object, you will hold to the view until your practice is so natural, you go, hey, I'm holding, Asudal. Then you drop. So this is, there will be constant toggle between holding because it's a habit and dropping because it's a cultivation. The more holding you have and the less dropping you have tells you your cultivation requires a bit more jayu. The more dropping you have and less holding you have, it will tell you you're on track, you are a happier person. Because we are still caught up somewhat in old habits, you, you will still have holding. It will still happen. Holding to views, holding to taste, holding to fear of uh, people saying you, you still have that holding. But every time you find yourself doing that, you tell yourself the noble truths, the noble truths. Every time you remember the noble truth, when you hold, there is dukkha, don't hold, no dukkha. When you drop it, you let it go, it feels better. Immediately. Immediately. Then you say, I never feel better. You never drop. I can tell you that. If you tell me, I have never felt better. Like. I, I drop, but I never feel better. You never drop. You have the delusion you drop. It never happened. Okay? Because I'm telling you, when you really drop, when you really forgive, when you really let go, it's, you will not feel any dukkha. You will immediately feel the relief of dukkha. Okay? When any of the bond is cut off, meaning that person is at least cut off, you cut off any, of course you are Arya. It, when any of the bonds is cut off, meaning if the person is at least an area, yes, yes. You can cut these off, you are definitely an area, okay? Oh, wow. <clears throat> if you can cut, definitely you're an area. If you can reduce, you are heading in the general direction. You get C plus really. It's just like that. Well, I like this question because this person knows. He, he kind of gets it really. Yes, yes, yes. Can I say in short that by developing the Eightfold Path, these bonds will be cut off? Yes. In short. Which links of DO allowed one to escape from the samsaric cycle? Ignorance. Complete cessation of... You complete dropping your ignorance. That's it, you're in business. Of course, the last five factors, right? The last five factors, attachment to Rupa, Arupa, the Maya, the, the Rupa, Arupa, Wachara. And then, uh, 
mana, restlessness, avidya, ignorance. That last, the last one, the last one is ignorance. You drop ignorance, you're finished. Escape. But, but I, I tell you something. Ignorance is really the four noble truth, but not as an idea, as a lens. That's the fundamental difference. We think of, it, of four noble truths as dukkha, origin, cessation, path. That's what you must remember. Dukkha, origin, cessation, and path. This is your fundamental thing about, about the noble truths. When there is holding, there is dukkha. Dukkha, origin, right? When there is, origin is what? Craving. When there is craving, there is dukkha. When there is cessation of craving, no dukkha. Every time in any experience, you experience dukkha, you know there is a craving going on. There is a craving there. So when you experience something and it feels unpleasant, painful, craving is present. That's your trick, your trigger. Craving is there. Then you say, I, I don't want to be nasty. I don't want to be nasty. That is sila. You are bringing in your sila, your morality, your restraint to hold. And then that is when you must turn, turn the unpleasant into pleasant. So we say dana, right? It's always this dana, sila, bhavana. Every time you experience dukkha, you must immediately say there is craving. What must you do? Dana. Let go. Dana is actually, Dana is, I know it's been translated as giving. Giving up. Giving away something. Giving kindness. Giving metta. Giving wholesome mental energies. That's what it means. And if you are giving wholesome mental energy, that's why you say, if you're angry, you bring out the meta, it's giving wholesome mental energy, which therefore is a form of restraint, which therefore is a form of cultivation. Dana, sila, bhavana is one thing, not three things. It's always been explained as giving morality, Cultivation, right? Bhavana. But actually, it's the same thing. When there is agitation, you give up. Give joy. Give metta. Give karuna. Give mudita. Give upeka. With this audience, I assume you all know what it means. Again, these four is one thing, not four things. Let me explain. If you're angry with someone, you give you 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 turn it into wholesome meta energy, right? Meta. But why did you do that? Because you have compassion for him. Then when he feels better, you're actually feeling mudita for him. And you are equanimous. How this one feels? It's actually it's it's the same. We are the same, same being. Same samsaric beings. So all of the mental energies can be converted. When you bring them together, that's when you really see the power of the practice. Initially, you understand that as separate, but eventually you must see them as one. Like I've always said, eightfold path is actually one practice, three parts. But the three parts come together, you have the path. The three parts taken separately, there's no path. Three parts come together. And it's the same thing. Dana, Sila, Bhavana. It's three parts to a practice. Every time you let go of anger, you're forgiving. 
that is a restraint and it's a cultivation. It's just like that. Okay? The reason why I will urge everyone to literally memorize some aspects of the training is because then you can see it very fast. In daily life, you, you don't struggle. Mm, okay, let's remember. P-A-C-K. Hello. Sorry. It must be like that. And then you can see how they come together as one. Okay? It's one, 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 one last question, right? Question 11 will be the last. Thanks. Level 9. I, I level 9? Oh. Why is neutral feeling understood as ignorance? Since when? Feeling is neither ignorance or not. Ignorance can lead to all kinds of feelings. You can be ignorantly happy, or you can be ignorantly at pain, or you can be ignorantly neutral. Ignorance and feelings are not the same. Okay? They are not conjoined. But I can tell you this. If there is no... Um, no right understanding. I'm not even using the word ignorance or not because most time, even with right understanding, you may still be ignorant when you react. Okay? Let's just say, without right understanding and right practice, neutral feeling is experienced as painful. But when there is understanding and there is practice, neutral feeling will be experienced as pleasurable. Okay, how do we know that? When you have no understanding and no practice, you cannot sit on your own and not do something. The restlessness will drive you crazy. You will want, you will want to go and eat, la, talk, la, check your handphone, la, do something to stimulate, to, to have a stimulation. But if you have practice and understanding, you will find sitting out there, for those of you who have gone for retreats, right? And after many days of practice, you can actually sit very quietly, do nothing and feel very at peace. Quite nice, eh? Just watching breathing also shook. Don't know why. Last time, never think of breathing as shook. But now I sit down here, just there, rising, falling, rising, falling. Wow, oh, so nice. Understanding and practice will make anything nice. Neutral feeling also very nice. It's very real. It's just like that. That's the way things are. Okay? Okay. Can I just invite everyone to take a look at this? And for those of you who have joined me before, I think you are familiar with this writing. Maybe I should start changing it a bit. Huh? In gratitude. Um, it is really to encourage us all to remember to give back, not just take. We are already very fortunate in having the opportunity to listen to the Dhamma and to understand the Dhamma and to know what to do about practice. We are already very fortunate. So we, if you can, consider giving back. So this is where, I, I won't read through the whole thing since we all know these things already. I'll just summarize it like this. If we can give something back, we must never assume that what we have, what we are today, we, we should not take the blessing for granted. Someone did it right by us, we must do it right for others. Okay? And I would like, I would urge you all to donate, help, give support, but not just money. It's not just about money. You have skills, you have time, you have uh, the sort of things that you think can be helpful to spiritual organization or charity, go ahead. Even BDMS, which is the host of this tonight's session, even BDMS would appreciate your support. Thank you, thank you. And one last, last point is, if the Dhamma lasts long, we continue to enjoy supportive conditions for our own learning and practice and may we never deviate from the true teaching as long as life lasts. Okay. Um, dedication of merits. Let us dedicate the merits from participating in this wholesome Dharma activity 
to our departed relatives and friends. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Idam me nyati nang ho tu sukita hon tu nyata yo. Mano pumbang mano kamadam ma mano seta mano maya mana sa che padu te na ba sati wa karo ti wa tato nang du kang ma ang we ti. Chakang wa wahato padang Mano pumpang gamadam ma Mano seta mano maya Mano sa che pasane na Basati wa karoti wa Ato nang sukang mangweti Ichaya wa anapayini Ato nang sukang mangweti Ichaya wa anapayini Ato nang sukang mangweti Ichaya wa Anapaini Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu